Welcome to The Practice Podcast, a show created by lawyers to help lawyers in life and business without all the complicated lawyer language. Let's welcome Bast Amron founders and your hosts, Jeff Bast and Brett Amron. Hello. Hello, Brett Amron. Jeff Bast, how you doing? I'm well. I'm well. Today we have a special guest. You didn't say hi to Nelson. Hi, Nelson. Hi, Nelson. How you doing, bud? Today we have a special guest. We should say hi to our guest too. Hi, Dane. We have a special guest, our newest partner here at Bast Amron, Mr. Dane D'Souza. Hi, everyone. Hi, Dane. Dane, Hello. tell us about you. We, we usually do a long, elaborate introduction of our guests, but today we're going to let you do the introduction. Who are you? All and right. how'd you end up in that chair? So I am Florida native. I went to high school here. I went to elementary here. Went to college here. I had a great opportunity to go to UFC for law school. Sorry, you need to, to just where? let everybody know. Yeah, UFC. UFC. So I went to University of Chicago. Okay, for law Chicago. Yeah, I was going to California, even though I knew the answer, but... So I went to Chicago for law school and I ended up meeting my mentor there and got the opportunity to clerk with him in Delaware. Um, Who was that? So that was the Honorable Christopher S. Sanchi, who's a judge in Delaware. What kind of judge is he in Delaware? You're going to make us work for this. It's like a deposition, deposition, right? right? Judge Sanchi, you met him how? So Judge Sanchi is a Chicago alum, and he actually teaches a seminar there. And who? what kind of judge is he? Where does he sit? Can, let's give us a little background on him. So Judge Sanchi is a, a U.S. bankruptcy judge. He sits in the District of Delaware. Okay. And he and, is a Chicago alum and teaches Chapter 11 seminar in Chicago. I actually got interested in bankruptcy there through a professor called Doug Baird, who was one of the preeminent scholars, particularly on fraudulent transfers Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And so after that, I picked it up with Judge Sanchi's class. So he was teaching a seminar on chapter 11. And you're today a bankruptcy lawyer. Do you fashion yourself a bankruptcy lawyer primarily? Is that Uh, a fair? I think that's fair. I'm a a bankruptcy lawyer and litigator. Bankruptcy litigator. Before we get into that, I just have a question. Being a native South Floridian, going to school here through college, why Chicago? Because yeah, there's a lot high of high th- school, college. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of good law schools here. There's a lot of good law schools throughout the country, different parts of the country. How Chicago? I mean, obviously you got in there and that's gave you the option, but. Right. So at the time, Chicago was one of the, I think it was one of the top law schools. And I was looking to join one of the top law schools. I was interested in law and economics, which is why there was always the easy pitch into bankruptcy. Bankruptcy is kind of like, it's kind of like game theory. It's a multiplayer game. And so for me, Chicago was a natural sell. Mm -hmm. And I also had a great opportunity to join with the scholarship. So So did you go to law school knowing you wanted to do bankruptcy? It sounds like you said you had an interest in economics. So I didn't. When I started law school, I started thinking I was going to be a deal attorney. And it turns out that I did end up being a deal attorney, but it, it took a different path, right? What I learned is I actually liked the litigation world. And I learned that through early jobs, kind of working through summers. I also learned that doing moot court, I liked being in the courtroom. I still liked doing the deals and it interested me. And so bankruptcy was kind of a world where you merge those two. So you asked about my practice. My practice is very much that I do litigation, I do deals, I do a lot of bankruptcy, and it kind of merges both worlds. So you find yourself at Chicago you have the benefit of taking a seminar with a sitting U.S. bankruptcy judge. Right. Um, And then I had the opportunity to apply. So it was a chapter 11 seminar. mm -hmm. We learned about kind of practical stuff. That's He taught the theory, but also the practice. It was chapter 11 practice. So we went through dip financings. We went through all the stuff that maybe they wouldn't teach you in a, a 101 bankruptcy course, right? We talked about the actual practice of bankruptcy. And then I had the amazing opportunity to kind of go inside and not only learn it, but actually see it happen in the courtroom. And it was one of the most meaningful experiences for me, right? And that would be... That was... What experience? And that was while I was clerking with... what. So you end up clerking for this for Judge Sanchi, right? Yes. So I was a law clerk for Judge Sanchi, and I got the opportunity not only to look through pleadings, but to kind of sit through the hearings and see it play out. Mm -hmm. How long of a clerkship was it? I was there for a year. Candidly, it was the first time I had been in Delaware. It was the day I moved in there. Mm -hmm. 
it was one of the most meaningful opportunities. So let me ask you, Dane, you were in the seminar with Judge Sanchi as the teacher. He was a sitting bankruptcy judge. How did you go from being a student to being his law clerk? I mean, you were one of how many students in the class? I think I did very well in his class. And so I was also writing a paper on a topic. I was interested in bankruptcy and writing articles on the topic. And so I'm guessing that kind of led to a little bit of... Interest, mutual interest. Exactly. Okay. So you talked to the judge and ultimately did a clerkship. So it was a one-year clerkship. You moved to Delaware for the first time. Was that your first time actually moving there or did you visit before? No. So the first day, I mean, I rented an apartment through the internet <laughs> and, and I showed up. Have you heard of that, the internet? No, or, yeah, no, I'm like, not familiar. So, <laughs> no, I, I found an apartment on the internet. I moved in, in, I think it was like a hurricane or a storm. And that was my first experience in Delaware. And then mm-hmm. I started the gig and I learned a, a lot. Right. And um, for those who are, maybe there's some non-bankruptcy lawyers listening or lawyers or law, law students that you know are not that familiar with clerkships, Tell us just a little bit about what the clerkship is and what you did, what your role was. So I guess every judge has is different, right? I think the most important thing, and I told this to young lawyers that I work with and to folks in school, the most important thing about a clerkship is it's your one opportunity as a junior attorney to see a case play out at the forest level. You actually get to see a case and see what goes on behind the scenes and you get to kind of observe, right? And so when you step into private practice and you're working on an individual motion or a first day pleading, or you understand what goes into it and you understand the why, and that's important for a junior attorney, right? Because if you understand the why, you understand how to structure the pleading and where kind of the pressure points are. Well, and you also get to see some behind the scenes, right? Like what is the court what does a judge look for and how, how does a judge formulate his or her opinions, which I think can be quite useful as a practicing attorney when you flip to the other side and you're actually standing in front of a judge, either arguing in front of the judge in court or writing a pleading or a motion, right? Because you will take that experience and use it. I think that's right. And I think the other practical thing that I picked up on is the importance of kind of small things. It's the importance of citing cases properly Mm. and making sure that you're not making little mistakes that are sometimes meaningful and quite evident. And so if someone has sloppy citations, right, or if there's a case that maybe it wasn't described properly, maybe the folks looking at this pleading are going to think twice about it, right? They're going to question you a little bit more. And I think that's an important part of being a litigator, right, is knowing where what the people that are looking at these papers and ultimately making the decision, what the process is. Well, right. the details are important, right? The broad brush is important, but the details are extremely important. It is. Right. And so you're saying that typos and miscites and mischaracterizations not only reflect poorly on the writer, but they also give a sort of a negative feel to the reader, which is the judge or the judge's law clerk. And that presumably a writing, whatever it is that's being written by a judge is a piece of advocacy, right? right? And so you're trying to advocate a position to the person reading it. And the reader is reading it and not believing in the writer. You know, you're not doing a great job of your advocacy. That's right? exactly. So it's already a chink in the armor of your case. That's exactly right. I think it's one of the parts of advocacy and it's one of our jobs, frankly, is to make sure that we are, every bit of our pleadings, every bit of our argument is kind of tailored to winning and and making sure that we're advocating on behalf of our client. And I don't know that you're, I think you're shortchanging yourself if you haven't taken a second look before you file your pleading to make sure your citations aren't all over the place or some things, there's not a typo because the question I think I would ask, right, is if you see a pleading with typos all over the place, well, then should I spend a little more time looking at how we're describing the cases or what the argument is? So we all have to be careful with what we say, but do you have a story, and I'll share one, I clerked for a judge, I was in law school. And so I don't know if you have a story that stands out to you during your time clerking for Judge Sanchi. For me, the story was, I'm sitting next to the judge and the witness would sit in a trial. 
and there were lawyers arguing in front of her in a fairly decent sized litigation matter. And we go back into chambers and the judge looked at me and her staff and said, I, I cannot believe the lawyer just, he just lied to me. And I was like, I just sat back, you know, as a law student, did I was like, know, oh my like, God, lawyers you, lie? Yeah, like, right, no, right, no. Right. I didn't know because right, I, I came in in, in the middle of right, the case. Right. And so I had no idea. And she's, and it was a you know pretty reputable firm, big firm, like reputable lawyer. And she just said, I cannot believe he just lied to me. That story sticks in my head. I've been practicing for over 20 years. That is a long time ago. And that still sticks in my head today. So there's so many paths you can go with that. Because if you're the judge, it's not only is, are you inclined to rule against that person, but mm-hmm. it's such a sign of disrespect to look yeah. someone in the eye and yeah. lie to them, especially just any human yep. being, parent, child, friends, you know, whatever it is, or any relationship, but especially lawyer, judge where there's supposed to be a very high threshold of respect and dignity and honesty. And wow, that's uh, that yeah, pretty so good. That's not going to get you far. To, getting bad. back to economics and game theory, it's not a single player game. It's not a single event game. Right? No. Right. Like you're going to be in front of that judge again. Sure. And judge is going to remember it, right? The people who, people who you practice with mm-hmm. are going to remember it. The people who are on the other side. And so that thing kind of sticks with people. Yeah. Well, so it's especially with bankruptcy because well, bankruptcy is well, the ju- yeah. smaller bar, smaller bench. But, you're appearing before the but same you, judges. But as a lawyer, I mean, not even a lawyer, right? Anybody, a human being. It's hard. It takes a long time to establish your character, your reputation. It's right? very easy to very lose it. Very easy to lose it in a matter of second, right? And so do you have any similar stories during your time or a story that stands out to you of something? It could be. It doesn't have to be negative. No, it can be, be a positive like, thing. Well, it's just experience you know, as I, a law I, clerk. I think the best experiences for me were sitting in that courtroom mm-hmm. and, and seeing the personalities. Because yeah. for me, it it kind of, I understood a little better who I wanted to be as a litigator yeah, and what kind of litigator I wanted to be okay. and what was important when I was litigating and kind of the things you can prepare for and the things you can't, right? You have to know the rules of evidence and you have to be ready and able to kind of go through some pretty dense rules on very quickly, right? You have to know your case and, and you have to be ready to answer questions. I think the most important things for me were seeing what worked and what didn't work. Mm-hmm. And it's something I think I took with me to this day. Fantastic. So you talked about how you started law school. You were thinking you wanted to be a deal lawyer. You decided that you were really interested in litigation. And then you found bankruptcy as the middle ground because the multiplayer and game theory. Well, I've never really had to make the decision yet, right? So I still do litigation. I still do deals. And bankruptcy is the way that I'm able to do both, tie both in. So bankruptcy, yeah, from your perspective is what I was getting to, is, a, is more of a hybrid, right? Is that what you like about it or what do you like about bankruptcy as a practice area? For me, what I like about bankruptcy is exactly that, right? Every day is different for me. I could be doing a deal one day, drafting an LOI. The next day I could be in court and have oral argument. It also prepares you for things outside of the bankruptcy concept, outside of just a pure restructuring. Right? What do you mean? doing deals and doing general litigation outside. So, you know, like if your company sided, once you file for bankruptcy, every all the litigation starts getting funneled through there, right? So you've done the deal, say it's a 363 sale, you've prepped the deal papers, you've gone through it, right? But then at the same time, you have this litigation aspect that every single case that existed outside is now going to be litigated inside. So I've been able to to while do, doing deals, litigate environmental issues, construction and lean litigation, pretty much anything you can think of. And that's why I've, I'm hesitant to say just it's bankruptcy. It's, it's not really just bankruptcy, right? It's, right? it's litigation and deals, and it just happens in the context of, right. of a restructuring. It's very much a multidisciplinary practice. That's you have exactly to do a little it. bit of everything. I think bankruptcy practitioners are one of the last general practitioners. Hmm. I think that's right. I mean, listen, I am not a deal lawyer. I am a litigator at my core. And I always like to say I know enough about bankruptcy to be dangerous. But those are the guys you should be worried about. Exactly. Claim not that. I'm not really a bankruptcy yeah. guy. I don't really know the code. But you can surround yourself with people, right, that can 
pick up some of those areas, right? Like Jeff is much better as a deal guy than I am. And so that's why, you know, we make, I think, a good partnership. But you're right that there are so many different facets to bankruptcy practice. And you know people that get themselves into trouble all the time when they walk in and they don't know what they're doing and they try to do it. And they think, you know, we saw a lot of people who became bankruptcy lawyers in 2009 and 10 that are no longer practicing bankruptcy law because it was a hot practice area and they jumped in and they felt like, oh, they could do it. You can't do that. You can't dip your toe in. I remember from that time, a lawyer who I met at some event in like 2009 or 2010, Mm -hmm. I said, oh, what's your practice area? And she's like, well, I used to be a real estate lawyer, but now I'm a bankruptcy lawyer. She didn't know what I did. And I was like, oh, you're a bankruptcy lawyer? She goes, yeah. Well, I just, I'll file the case. But after that, I, I can't, you know. Sounds like a petition preparer like, that is like, to me. That yeah. is, you are not a bankruptcy yeah. lawyer. You're a lawyer filing bankruptcies, but you are not a bankruptcy lawyer. Right. And that, that was the same as like all the new real estate agents that right, came exactly. online, you know, right. around that time too, you know, estate. and suddenly now maybe too, there's right. all these new real estate agents that really weren't. So, but yeah, I mean, I think bankruptcy provides that in addition to getting involved with a bunch of different industries. Yeah. It's not just focused on one industry, you know? So you're in Delaware, you're practicing bankruptcy law, you were with a big firm, and then you ended up coming back to Miami, right? So yeah. Like, what happened? Like, what made you come back? I met my wife while I was up there, mm-hmm. and we were both from Miami. So I went to a school called Gulliver, and she went to my rival school, Ransom. Mm-hmm. And we met, and we ultimately decided to get married. And then from there, we knew we had to come home. You were in Delaware when you met? Um, even though. You- Yeah, coincidentally, right? So I was working in Delaware. She had moved to Philly at the same time I had moved. So I was in Delaware for a number of years. As far as where I lived, I ended up moving to Philly because it's just hop, skip, and a jump away from Wilmington. And it was there when I was moving, she was also moving to, Mm -hmm. to Philly at the same time. And so a mutual friend from Miami basically said, oh, I have this friend that's moving there at the same time. That's how we met. So two Miami kids who met in Philadelphia. Exactly. Right? That's, that's a cute love story. We could make a uh, film. Sounds like a that, rom-com. Maybe. I think yeah. we, can, right. <laughs> we can get that going. All right. So you come back to Miami. You're with a big firm. Both you and I are from the same alma mater, great firm. And now you've recently made the move to our firm. For a lawyer moving, moving cities, let's say, because we know we've gone through this a lot. There's a lot of lawyers out there who have moved to Miami. And a lot of them are who are considering moving to Miami. What's uh, any advice for someone thinking about that, making that move? It's a little easier for you because you're from here, but. Right. So for me, it was a little different and it's easier because I was moving back home. And so I kind of knew Miami, is it a little big town or a big little town? I don't one of know. those. It's one of those. Everyone that I know that's from Miami, we all know each other. And it's the six degrees of separation don't really work here. It's more like two or three at best. Yeah. yeah. And so for me, coming back home was that, coming back home, right? You get to see family, friends, and connections that kind of in Miami are very important. And I found important in my practice here. So that is kind of the bigger difference coming back for me to Miami. And then as far as the firms, it's kind of a progression, right? So in Delaware, I was able to kind of grow up to begin a practice, right? Get some great experience and to be under the wing of some amazing people. I was able to do that too at Hunton when I moved back to Miami. And for me now, this is the next step, right? At Bass Amron, I kind of have the platform to do, to expand on what I've been able to achieve and look to the future. And so what were you looking for in terms of making the jump, right, to uh, clearly we're a smaller firm, boutique, although we do have, you know, a bit of a national practice in certain areas. And so what were you looking for in terms of that jump and that leap and not just saying, well, I want to go to another big firm or another, you know, there's a difference. There's a difference. Well, for me, it kind of happened organically. And I don't think of it in in terms of big firms and small firms, especially in our practice where the bankruptcy bar is a little smaller, right? I don't really think of it in big firms and small firms. I think it happened organically, and this provides me a similar platform and the ability to kind of grow a practice that I've been continuing to refine over almost a decade or over a decade now. 
I like that you don't think of it as big firms and small firms. And I think one way to look at it is the practice group. So even if you're at a big firm, you could be at a hundred lawyer. That's not so big anymore, I guess. But let's say a hundred lawyer office, which is a good size office, but you're really part of a practice group. And so if there's five people in that practice group, you're working with those five people there. Yeah, there are other people down the hall, but you know, in terms of an insolvency litigation group, you know, we have almost 15 lawyers here, 13. That's a pretty sizable group for that practice. So right. that is really what matters is what's the size of the group? Who are the people you're going to work with at whatever, whatever firm you're at? Right. And for me, I was just lucky that it kind of happened organically, mm-hmm. yep. right? Yep. I knew Jeff from, he was a Hunton alum. So I knew people that have worked with Jeff. His picture's up on the wall there, right? I mean, there's like a I'm gonna hall work of fame. I'm going to work on that. <laughs> no, I, I feel like there should be. Uh, and Jeff should idea. be in the in the. Yeah. I have only class. the fondest memories of that place. I really love the firm. I love the people. And so it's a great place. I, like you, am not someone who left, and, and Brett, the same thing, who left right. their firm because they were unhappy. Correct. You just left for something different, you know, for a change and for a growth opportunity. Yeah, it's just an evolution. Right. right of you individually and then your career and that's what it is and so right. i like the idea of organic change but it's part of the evolution but it does you know? sounds like also you so in in your delaware how big was the office that you worked in in delaware oh so i don't know exactly how many numbers, lawyers so don't Park. quote me but it's probably about 30 to 40 mm-hmm. maybe a little more or okay little. but a small office of a big firm would you oh, say yeah. that Exactly. But again, it's a restructuring practice. Right. right. And so, so you look, if you're in the restructuring wing of a practice, it's really that practice that you're dealing with on an yeah. everyday basis. Right. And the 30 is at different practice areas, right? Right. And so it was, right. So even the restructuring practice is smaller. Right. So it was even smaller number of people that you were really concentrated. Yeah. I say that to, I tell it to young lawyers, law students all the time is, don't so focus so much on the size of the office, but the, the actual practice. Gra- practice group and really the personalities in that group because those are the people you're going to work and live and grow and That's learn right. from. I think it's especially true in restructuring too because we do a lot internally, right? There's restructuring folks do both litigation, they do bankruptcy, they do deals. And we kind of have a, a weird practice where we keep a lot of that internally because everyone has a different kind of niche in our practice. And so, yeah, it is like that. And so what Bass Amron gives me is a a similar platform in terms of national presence and a a bunch of great folks to work with. And me and Brett. And you and Brett. (laughs) Dane, any parting words for our listeners out there who might be thinking of uh, either moving cities or transitioning from being a big firm to small firm or just any advice? Well, if they have any questions, they can reach out. Oh, that's a great idea. If you do have any questions for Dane, you can reach him. His contact information is below. And if you like this episode, please give us five stars and share this podcast with your friends, family, colleagues, even with your enemies. If you want to share this podcast with anyone you know, please do. Thanks very much. Thanks, Dane. Thanks, Nelson. Thank you, Nelson. Thanks, guys. For more information on this show and other resources, visit FastAmron.com and connect with us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram at FastAmron.com.